This morning, um, I have a, a message that I've entitled, It's Not a Talent Show. Or, I'm, I'm going to let you make the decision. I've also thought of, dig it up. And you'll see at the end when I get to the, the end of this, this message this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. And we'll be starting reading in verse 14. Parables are an exciting way of challenging us to tre- like a treasure hunt. It's the mystery of God that He wants to share with us. If we pursue Him, diligently seek Him with all of our heart, He gives us insight into the nature of life and, and the, in a thousand ways. And I, I was just thinking about it this morning. When Jesus gives us a parable, I, I, I don't know that we grasp it. He is giving us a download from heaven. He's, this isn't just, I mean, I think sometimes we just go, oh, it's a nice story. No, no, it's not a nice story. He's telling us, he's giving us a revelation of himself. Starting in verse 14 in Revelation 25. Turn this on here. Of Matthew, yes. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted him trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, and to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work, and again five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the, uh, another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and and share your, your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold, Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown, and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you, his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I, I, har, har, I, that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money in deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will, ha- they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was looking at this in context of what's around it. But I was thinking of many sermons I've heard, because we always use the King James Version, and he gave one of them five talents. That's what the, this, this scripture usually talks about when we think about in the, old, the, the, the times that we've heard this sermon. We've talked about talents. Of course, that, that's what he has to be talking about. But it's, it's important that we get a, a little grip on what exactly this word talents means here. Many a servant we've heard, What is your talent for the Lord? But that's not what I'm saying you to do today. If you can be misled into thinking that he's talking about some natural ability. But in biblical times, this word talent meant a defined amount of money. In biblical Greek, the word talenton, the uh, ancestry of the word talent means a measuring unit of weight, not a coin. It wasn't even a coin. It was was just a, a figure of measurement. It was often of money, such as of talent of gold or silver. It was a definite amount of money in the story that Jesus was telling, but it represents something else in our lives. We shall see in a moment why it cannot represent natural gifts which we possess. But But the major question before us is this. What has the Lord given us to invest, which corresponds with the talents given to the servants in the parable? You know, a couple weeks back, I preached a sermon on the judgment seat of Christ. And I believe that in this parable, you're going to see just images that also go along with that. 
In the parable here, it sits in between the parable of the ten virgins, which means that they had to be, be ready, and it also sits in the, in the midst of the parable of the sheep and the goats. Sandwiched in between these two parables, I believe he's talking about salvation also here and talking about being prepared. See, salvation is the very thing at stake in this parable. It is the ultimate thing because it says in verse 30, And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, the Gospel of Mark talks about it like this when he says in, in Mark 13, 33, he says, Be on your guard, be alert, you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away, almost just like this same story. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and he tells one at the door to keep watch. He's telling us, in fact, in the very first, the verse before, in verse 13 of Matthew 25, he says, Be on your guard, be alert. The parable describes an outcome of history that will actually take place. That's what, it was, what came into my mind as I was thinking about this. This is something that is actually going to happen. So let's compare these talents. Let's go back to verse 14. It says, again, I, it will be like a man going on his journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. The key word here is his wealth. It's not something that I possess. It's something that he has that he gives me. It's something that he owns. It is actually God's property. See, they are the Lord's property. They are not our own. They're not something that we can just do with as we freely want. These talents are, that are distributed are like natural gifts that He gives out of His well-being. They are free to all men. They are, he is willing to distribute them as, as though they are His property. This is, what, this is what, it is God alone who distributes them. It is God alone that they belong to. This is what he says, it's, it is his quantity in which he can give it, or he can say, I will give you less. He is God. He does as he wishes, with whom he wishes, and it, the amount of which he wishes. It doesn't appear to be something that I can do on my own. My own. It is a grace fully given by him. The next verse says this, it says, And to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one one bag, each according to his ability. Now this was, a this was something I was not prepared for. When I looked up this word ability, I knew it had, something to do, it had something to do with God because it had to do something outside of ourselves. But the word that he used there was the word dunamis. Hmm. Some of you who know what that word means, it's like, oh, wow. Ability, it's, it's a, an ability to perform in the believer's life, to, a power to achieve by applying the Lord's inherent abilities. Power through God's ability. It is the power that fell on the day of Pentecost. That was dunamis power. It's needed in every area of, of our lives. Again, the last phrase in this is very helpful because he's saying it's not, in, it's not something that we can do, it's according to his ability. It's something that He gives us. And I think it's amazing to me is that God does this. He knows exactly what we can handle in advance. He knows how many bags He can give us before we even come. He knows exactly, some of us need more, some of us are less. Because we're, He knows exactly what our abilities are. And we're only responsible for what He gives us. You are not responsible for what He gives me. You are only responsible for what God gives you. God in advance knew this. God was orchestrating things in our lives so He can accomplish what He desires to do. So it's His ability. The next clue is this, and it's not really found in the Scripture, but it is this, it's this it's, it's, He was giving these things away. It was this godly expectation that He could require of us as He sees fit. Well, that doesn't fair. That's who God is. <laughs> He's a king. He can do as He wishes. It stated, the Lord expected these servants to invest the talents He distributed in such a way that they would produce gain. The talent then is something that can be invested, it can be risked with the possibility of loss or gain. The decision to risk is wholly the servants. He can choose whether to risk it or He can, he can simply do nothing with it. As the first two servants did, they, they, they gave what they, they were supposed to do and they gained. The last one who utterly refused to do what God had told him to do. 
The master, he's saying this. The master did not exact, say, exactly say how it was to be invested. He just said, I want to return. This area will begin a discussion that I want to bring up this morning just for a short time. It's just the will of God. See, people are always asking, what's God's will? The picture given here is a great example. The owner does not tell him how he has to do it. He just say, only expects him to be a steward of what God has given him. What if he'd lost it? I don't think the master would have been angry with him. If he would have invested it and he wouldn't have gained, I don't think he would have been angry with him. Because he at least tried. He risked it. He expects us to be a steward. The will of God, it is, is it precise or is it open-ended? See, I believe at times we, we want that, that precise will of God, but a lot of times God says, listen, before you I have opened doors, and these two doors are for you to go through. You can choose which one you want to go through. It's your choice. Your decision based upon the fact that you make a godly decision. Can you imagine in the midst of all this, that God can take a decision of either left or right that I make, and He can still bring His glory through it. It's almost like I was thinking this, this week, I was thinking, it would almost be like, and some of you kids play in the band, it would be like somebody who plays a trumpet, and he can just basically, he's in the orchestra, and you can play whatever, you, you can play the, the, the tune that you want to play, and he still can make it, make mu beautiful music. He can still bring it all back together. Because He gives us that choice. Some of us may feel ill-equipped and clumsy at first. But nevertheless, I want us to know this morning, it's just stepping out in that place where God can use us. He's, we're free to choose how to invest it. The talent is not given to the servant for his own use. It remains the property of his absent Lord. And it is risked on the Lord's behalf. There is no promise made to the servants that they will share in any of the wealth when, they give, when he gives them this money. They have no right to deduct, to, to deduct a broker's fee, which many of us like to do. God, I'm out, you know what, I might as well just use a little bit of this. The Lord alone would benefit from this transaction. God can make an expectation without imposing onto our free will and let us still choosing which way we want to go. So look at these talents. These are the things about them. These talents are free to invest. They belong to Him. They are our God-given ability, God ability and there are His expectations attached to them. So what are these talents? Are they the, what we've heard in the past is it because I can play beautiful music or I can, I can dance and do all these things? No, I don't believe that's what he's saying here. He's saying is this, I've given you something. They are these golden moments or opportunities for God to, to work in our lives. If I can use Tracy again, sorry I'm always picking on you, but you went up to see her uncle who was unsaved. The golden opportunity was before her. She was scared in front of the whole family. Some of them don't believe. Some of them might mock her. Her uncle's passing away. They're not doing well. Or did he already pass? He's okay. She steps out and begins to share her faith. What God's done in her life. What God can do in your life. And there's this empowerment, this emboldenment that the Holy Spirit brings in those moments. Those golden opportunities. Those divine encounters where God says, let me, if you'll just step in place, let me blow the breath of God upon your back. And the power of the Holy Spirit illuminated that room. And he accepted the Lord. Such opportunities are moments of decision. We can choose to play it safe, or we can get what we want out, out of it for ourselves, or we can re risk our reputation in order that God may have what He wants. These are the decisions that we make every day. Will this give me what I want, or will this make it possible for Jesus Christ to work? Should I yield my passions and not do this or do that? 
Should I follow my friends? They're urging when they want me to go this direction. Or should I discipline myself before God and choose the way He wants me to go? Should I accept this promotion even though it may cause me to do something that I shouldn't be doing? Or should I pass it up and make less money but be in a place where I need to be with the Lord? See, the possibility is all before us. God gives us the opportunity. All of us have this choice. Perhaps there's no moral issue about it. Maybe it just means it's one of those situations where do I invest my time with my neighbor? Do I spend time with somebody? Maybe because they're going through something, I just spend that time with them and love on them. It's almost inevitable that if I risk for God, I am going to get hurt. That if I put myself out there vulnerable, I will most certainly be taken advantage of or maybe emotionally wounded. My answer to you today is yes. Or you can play it safe. Or you can never let go of the balance beam. Off the team. off the team, whatever, you know, you just, there's so much instability, so much that we don't understand, that, that we don't know. For me, growing up, it was, uh, a lot of you guys know, my mom died giving birth to me, and my dad remarried, then my stepmom died in a car accident when I was nine, then my dad got married again, then my dad died of cancer when I was 12, and so I'm in junior high, my mom's dead, my stepmom's dead, my dad's dead. The only close relatives I had were my, my aunt and uncle, George and Sandra. And then when I was in high school, they got in a fight, and my uncle George shot and killed my aunt, and then stuck the gun to his own head, killed himself. So I'm 16 years old, and this is life to me, going, man, what's next? Everything seems to be falling apart, and we get a little worried, we get a little scared. And this is what Christians do, you know, they try to serve God, but then things get a little rocky. And things get a little unstable. And so we go, okay, that was nuts. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to live like that. Let me, uh, let me hold on. And this is your routine. This is what so many people do. They go, you know what? I'm not going to try anything crazy. I'm just going to sit here. And uh, I'm just going to hold on. And uh, this is what you look like. You just go... Uh, this is what people do. You know what? I'm just going to have my nice little family. We're just going to, um, you know, we're just going to keep to ourselves. We're going to live in a gated community. I'm going to homeschool my kids, make them wear helmets everywhere. I'm going to, um, you know, I'm not going to let them outside because sun has bad rays. I'm going to, um, you know, just on and on and on. And you just live your life in the safety of I don't want to do anything crazy for God. I just... I just want to, you know, go to church on Sundays and maybe give like 2% um, and uh, maybe serve help in nursery because I feel guilty. And then you do this your whole life and then you, you go, your greatest prayer is like, God, you know what? I would love to die in my sleep and not even feel it and then just go up to heaven. And so that you want to die like this, just in your sleep, ooh, right in the middle of a dream, good dream, the dream you're going to heaven and you don't even feel it and then suddenly you wake up you stand before the judge and you go now if uh, could you imagine could you imagine watching the Olympics you know and some girl does that, just gets up there, starts straddling the thing, and then steps off and goes... <laughs> what is the judge supposed to do on the card? You see, and to me, I go, man, that's the routine that so many Christians are headed for. That's the routine, the boring, I do nothing crazy because I don't want to fall. I, that's the routine that they're going to live and then one day it's going to be a shock because they're going to step off that balance beam and realize they're standing before the judge. They're standing before the judge and you think he's going to look at that routine and go, wow, well done. 
well done. You lived the safest life possible. You didn't slip. You didn't fall. See, that's not the life that God's called us to. That's where the majority will head. But I don't want to go where the majority goes. The first man, he gained a 100% return. In terms of application, he made use, full use of his opportunities for the Lord. Not for his own advancement, but for the Lord's. He put the kingdom of God first and its righteousness. He made crucial decision on the investment of what God had given him. How many times do we worry more about ourselves and how it's going to affect us and how we're going to feel and I may be broken hearted I may um, it, it may hurt he's saying listen will you just step out there Brandon and I went to lunch this week and he said something to me he says Greg I want gold and I thought to myself what are you talking about he says you preach that sermon on the judgment seat of Christ. I want gold. Not gold in this world. I want gold on the day I stand before God. This morning, that is my message to you. Is Do you want gold? Or do you want to be served in this life? See, I want to say with Brandon... Brandon, I want gold too. He made full use of everything God had given him. And he did it. He actually followed through. He actually followed through indeed. See, we always today, we just talk about this, this relationship with God just being this faith. But we don't, we don't want to talk about the fact that we have to do something. That there's something that follows it. See, I can just sit around and go, I have all the faith in the world. I got this bag of gold. But if I don't do something with it, see, everything God does for us. He says, listen, I'm giving you this opportunity for you to do something with it. The all three had choices to make. But only two were rewarded. Will Christ say well done when we stand before Him? Enter into my joy? There are many times that I've read this parable and I've seen this part. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your gold in the ground. See here, what belongs to you? I've thought about this scripture before, and I've always taken the idea that the master was a hard man. But he wasn't. There's nothing in the story other than this man's bad attitude that said that about this master. It's just this guy, and why? Was it because he only received one bag? Why couldn't I have had five? See, how many times in our Christian walk are we like that? Well, look what you've done for them. I would do better too, God, if I had that. The subjects all belong to God. And it is a reward that he delivers. The problem with this man was a proud heart. I didn't get what everybody else got, so you know what? This master was not unjust, but maybe he was fueled with pride. Another place I was thinking about is, is this how many times in our lives do we do kind of like what Francis Chan was talking about? You know what? I, it's a lot easier for me just to go into my own little world Hide over here. I talked about this weeks ago. I said, you know what? If I can just stay in my little corner of the universe, I can serve God just fine right over here. But see, that's not the way He designed it. The love that He wants to show through you is the power that is manifested through Him, through us. That's what He wants to do through us. He desires you to show that love. He desires for you to be that witness in this world. 
I would be better off just taking care of me. That way I won't get hurt, disappointed. I won't have to spend any of my money. I'll offer you a second solution to this man. Is that he was playing the end against the middle. What if he said, what if my master doesn't return? I'll go dig a hole in the backyard here. If he doesn't come back, hey, it's my gold. How many times do, do we kind of operate like that? We're not truly sold out on this thing. You know, this whole Christianity thing that you're talking about, Greg. I, I can buy into little parts of it, but you're asking me to be whole hog in the thing. Yeah, because that's what this relationship looks like. Do we really believe this thing or are we just in it to make ourselves feel better? How in are we? I would offer to you today that this is when we truly invest in the Master's work. We get emotionally invested, spiritually invested, and financially invested. Something happens in us. I think about this, and you know, I don't talk about church finances, and I don't, I, don't, I don't even pass an offering plate. We just have a box in the back, because I don't want it to ever be something that would cause somebody to go, oh, I don't know, about, you know, they're just about money. But I want us to think about this. God gives me the opportunity every month. He says, Greg, I'll give you 90% to live on. Just give me 10% back. It all belongs to Him anyway. Some of us, I know, and I've talked to some of you guys, it's like, you know, and I've been there. I've told my wife this many years ago. I'm like, honey, if, if I give a full 10%, it is, I don't think the kids are going to eat. I'm going to eat, of course. But, I mean, the kids aren't going to. So I'm trying to appeal to her, her uh, you know, compassion. But you know what? I think there's a place in our lives where we just go, you know what, God? I'm going to begin right here. I'm going to start with this amount. It's not 10% yet. That's okay. God's looking. He says, be faithful in the little things. And I'll reward you. I am not going to tell you some gospel today that says, okay, you start giving to God and everything's going to be great for you. I don't believe that happens. I believe that it, it, it falls on the just and the unjust alike. But I do believe this, that there is a faithfulness that God desires out of us. And my obedience, He sees that. And I begin and say, okay. And I did that. I said, okay, we're going to begin right here. Here's a hundred. Lord, increase it. Okay, here's two hundred. God, here's five hundred. Here's eight hundred. God, I can't believe I'm able to give this much. But he starts with us as we start just giving him that little bit of, to start with. And I would encourage you, all of you, if you're going to give, give out of the envelope. That way you can see what God has blessed you with the year before. And you'll go, amazing. You'll go, I did that? Okay. And then watch as God blesses you and you give a little bit more. Not because I'm saying, oh, okay, I, we need the money. That's not. The point is, it is your blessing. It is what God wants to do through you. He wants to see if we're going to be obedient. That's the, probably the most message you'll ever hear on finances here. Trust your master. Be faithful with your talent. Is your faith this morning on autopilot? Or have you made your faith in Jesus Christ a priority? God paid an extremely high tab for you. What have you done with this gift that he's given you? But you see, the Bible says we are to be good stewards of all we've been given. This means that we live intentional in how we live each day, putting strength, energy, and enthusiasm in all we do for God. God is your life, so practice chasing God the way He has chased you. Don't be lazy. Don't squander what God has put, given you. Practice throwing yourself into every opportunity, every chance you have to pour into someone else. Do everything with excellence. Allow the zeal of God to motivate you. By living, loving, and serving fiercely, you will stay young at heart, and you'll stay close to His heart. He will be filled with joy, and you will be able to honor God. We use every opportunity, the golden opportunities, the encounters, the divine encounters, my money, my life, my time, my resources, all belong to Him. I have been bought, I've been purchased by His blood. 
The servant gained nothing because he risked nothing. When it was surfly buried in the backyard, he thought, okay, if my master doesn't come back, I've got something. How many times does our relationship with Christ look like that? C.S. Lewis in his book, for The Four Loves, said it like this. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up in a safe, in a casket, or in a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. I'm going to tell you this morning, it will. It will cost us something. But it's not too late. Some of you this morning, as I close, you need to go in your backyard today when you get home. And dig up what God's given you. You need to go in your backyard and dig it up. Some of you had encounters with God when you were young. Some of you had such encounters. But through life and through trouble and, and, and being vulnerable, you've been hurt. You've been, you've been ravaged. And God's saying, listen, don't go hide it. Go dig it up. It's not too late to invest what God has given you.